Hello, everyone. Bonjour. Um, so earlier today, the Minister of Finance released the amounts that households will be getting back every three months through what is now officially called the Canada Carbon Rebate. As tax season kicks in, Canadians should know that they are getting this money in their bank account every three months. La remise canadienne sur le carbone. C'est l'argent qui revient aux Canadiens avec le prix sur la pollution. Ils reçoivent cet argent, peu importe leur revenu. So, in Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario, and New Brunswick, where the federal backstop is in place, families are taking home more money next fiscal year than they did in the previous one. And as the carbon price goes up, more money is collected from big polluters and more money is given back to Canadians. So for a family of four, that is $1,800 a year in Alberta, $1,200 a year in Manitoba, $1,120 a year in Ontario, $1,500 a year in Saskatchewan, $760 a year in New Brunswick, $820 a year in Nova Scotia, $880 a year in PEI, and $1,190 a year in my home province of Newfoundland and Labrador. In Newfoundland and Labrador, Nova Scotia, and PEI, where we've also got the federal backstop, more homes use home heating oil. We've paused the fuel charge on home heating oil across Canada, so in places where a lot of homes are using it, there's less collected through the fuel charge. So the rebates in those provinces are adjusted to reflect slightly less revenue. People told us they needed some time so they could actually afford the upfront cost to get off home heating oil and to get off it permanently. And it is working. Thousands of people are using federal grants to make the switch to cleaner, cheaper, more reliable energy. They want to make the switch. We're giving them time and some help to do it. In every region where we have the federal backstop in place, Families are getting more money in their bank accounts every three months. It costs big polluters and it gives that money back to Canadians, especially lower and middle class families. So it's saving you money, it's cleaning our air. These are things that most Canadians want their government to do. Conservatives used to believe in them too because it's just common sense. Pierre Polyev has uh, staked his entire brand on cutting these payments to Canadian families, and I don't think that he cares. I don't think that he cares about the lowest income families who get the most money back here, and I don't think that he cares about the air you breathe, and I don't think he cares about the planet and how we give it to our grandkids. You see, he hasn't shown it. In my home province of Newfoundland and Labrador, a family of four is taking home $1,200 a year from the Canada Carbon rebate. And a single senior is taking home $600 a year. That is good policy. That is what Canadians expect from their government. Merci. Over to you. Stephen. Right here. Yep. <laughs> Thank you, Seamus. Merci. So today's announcement is a great news for Canadians who are having difficulties paying bills and want to secure a better future for their families. With the Canada Carbon Rebate, 8 out of 10 homes get more money back than they pay with low- and medium-income Canadians benefiting the most. But let's remember why we have the system. Putting a price on pollution is the cheapest way to reduce pollution-causing climate change. Economists, businesses, even past conservative leaders understood this. It is a cornerstone of our climate plan, accounting for about a third of all emissions reduction by 2030, helping us to keep on track in the fight and rapidly, uh, against a rapidly changing climate. And it bears saying, without Canada's revenue-neutral carbon pricing system, the cost to taxpayers and to the Canadian economy to achieve our climate goals would be far greater. Wildfires, floods, droughts, more intense storms, these all come with a substantial cost. In fact, the cost of natural catastrophes in this country has increased by a factor of 10 over the last decade. Sector by sector, our plan is working. We're bending the curve on pollution and building a stronger future. That includes developing the EV supply chain, phasing out fossil fuel subsidies, building a clean electricity grid from coast to coast, and much more. For the first time ever, Canada is on track to surpassing our climate target for 2026. 
We have the best emission record amongst the G7 countries in the last two years. The reality is we can fight climate change and pursue measures that make life more affordable at the same time. And yet we have the leader of the Conservative Party who in the absence of any kind of plan spreads misinformation and attacks a system that is in fact helping Canadians. But it shouldn't be a surprise coming from a party that continues to deny the very existing of climate change. He wants to make pollution free again. He wants to let big polluters and his friends, big oil, get off scot-free. And it's why he will never tell us if he would keep the pollution pricing system for heavy industry, for example. And why he never talks about what he would take, why, how he would take away the, the rebate payments out of the pockets of Canadians who need them the most. Let's cost, cut pollution instead of rebate payments, helping middle-class Canadians and those working hard to join it. Alors, l'annonce d'aujourd'hui est une excellente nouvelle pour l'ensemble de la population canadienne qui a de la difficulté à payer ses factures et qui veut assurer un avenir meilleur pour sa famille. Comme nous le savons toutes et tous, mettre un prix sur la pollution est le moyen le plus économique et le plus efficace de réduire nos émissions de gaz à effet de serre et la pollution climatique. La remise canadienne sur le carbone s'agit d'une mesure centrale de notre plan climatique qui représente environ un tiers des réductions d'émissions d'ici 2030. Secteur par secteur, notre plan fonctionne. Nous réduisons la pollution et bâtissons un avenir plus prospère pour l'ensemble de la population. Il s'agit notamment de développer la chaîne d'approvisionnement des véhicules électriques, de supprimer les subventions aux, com aux compagnies pétrolières et gazières, de construire un réseau électrique plus propre d'un océan à l'autre et bien d'autres choses encore. Pour la première fois dans l'histoire de notre pays, le Canada est en voie de dépasser son objectif climatique de 2026. Au cours des deux dernières années, nous avons enregistré la meilleure performance en matière de réduction des émissions de gaz à effet de serre de tous les pays du G7. Et pourtant, le chef du Parti conservateur, en l'absence de tout plan climatique, diffuse de la mésinformation et s'en prend un système qui, en fait, aide la majorité des Canadiens et Canadiennes. Contrairement aux conservateurs, nous voulons aider la classe moyenne et ceux qui travaillent fort pour la joindre. C'est ce que notre système de tarification de la pollution accomplit. Notre gouvernement continuera de défendre les intérêts de la population qui veut que son gouvernement fasse plus face au coût de la vie, mais également pour que nous ayons tous et toutes un avenir plus durable. I will now pass it over to Minister of Rural Economic Development, my colleagues, Gideon Chambers. Merci, Stephen. Friends, good afternoon. Bon après-midi à tous. Look, we know that friends are feeling, the Canadians are feeling the pressures of day-to-day -day costs when they sit around their kitchen tables. So we're taking action. You've heard us talk about the $10 a day childcare and the impact that that's having, especially on women getting back to work. We've introduced a national dental care plan. We've introduced rental relief. And they're all measures that help everyday Canadians with their day-to-day -day pocketbook issues. But we know that people who live in small and rural communities across Canada feel this more than others. Many of you hear me say I represent a lot riding that's a large man, land mass bigger than Switzerland. I have more than 200 communities. The largest community doesn't have a population of 20,000 people. So that means people spend a lot of time getting to work, going to school, or picking up groceries. That's a reality I've heard from my colleagues from every corner of our country that live in a small or rural community. So in recognition of the unique realities Canadians who live in small communities face, we have always topped up their Canada carbon rebate by 10%. And we've heard families in small and rural communities needed a little more help to keep up with the cost of living, so starting in April, we're doubling the rural top-up from 10 to 20 percent. So for a family of four in Alberta, that's an extra $360 a year. In my home province of Newfoundland and Labrador, it's an extra $240 every year. So friends, I want to be clear. Pierre Polyev and his Conservatives politicians, they're going to oppose this. In provinces where the fuel charge applies, most households get more back than they pay, and lower-income households benefit the most from our policies. Pierre Polyev has no plan to get you ahead. Our plan is going to help fight climate change, where, by the way, the impacts of climate change are the most in rural and small communities, and puts more money back in your pocket. Mr. Polyev has catchy solutions and catchy slogans, but we, my friends, have the solutions. Thank you. And we'll take questions now. And this morning you said, this morning you said, this morning I stood beside you, you said we don't have funds for large projects. We're talking about funding for roads. You said we don't have funds for large projects. Your government's spending $160 million to widen the Trans Canada up in Minister O'Regan's place. What do you mean when you say you don't have funds for large projects to fund road networks in this country? 
Uh, thank you very much for your question, David. Um, as opposed to the leader of the opposition, Pierre Poliev, who seem annoyed every time one of you find people ask him a question, I, in fact, think it's a privilege to be asked a question by you as a, as a federal cabinet minister, and I'm happy to take your questions. I was happy to answer your question this morning, David, and I'm happy to answer your question this afternoon. What I said is, and I, and I, I, I specified that I should have been more specific in, in, in that conference that I, that I gave last week in, in Montreal. I was referring specifically to projects like the Troisième Lien, but in that same conference, I specified that we still have funds, obviously, to maintain uh, and, and enhance our, our, our road network across the country. But I was talking specifically about projects like the Troisième Lien that the, the, the CAC government in Quebec wants to, wants to move forward with, which is something myself and, and many of my Ke Quebec cabinet colleagues have said time and time again, this is not a, a new policy at all. Well, the carbon, the carbon rebate now has a, a different name. You used to be calling it the Climate Action Incentive. Do you think that just changing the name is going to be enough to overcome the communications issues your government has had telling Canadians about these reasons? I think, I, I mean, I, I, what, I, what I'm hoping that people will, will remember from what we're doing today is the fact that this is helping Canadians uh, and, and Canadians who, who need it the most. And I, I, I think, granted, the, the previous name was a bit difficult to understand and, and, and even for, for many people to, to remember. So this will likely make it easier. We, will, we are working with financial institutions. Uh, so about 80% of people get, get direct deposits. We're working with financial institutions to, to make sure that it's labeled properly so that people actually know what it is. In many cases, it was very difficult for people to actually see that they were getting it. And the other 20% uh, get, get the rebate uh, through, by, by mail. Wait, when you said, when you said, well, I'll, I'll take a question in front. Déchets nucléaires de Chalk River. Ce matin, ici même, il y avait un groupe de Premières Nations appuyé par le Bloc québécois et le Parti vert mm -hmm. qui vous demande de suspendre l'attribution de permis concernant les espèces en péril le temps que leur contestation judiciaire procède en cours. Est-ce que vous êtes prête à suspendre ces permis? Alors, comme vous le savez peut-être, euh Au niveau de l'évaluation d'impact des projets nucléaires au Canada, c'est la Commission canadienne de sûreté du nucléaire qui, est, qui a la responsabilité sous la loi de, de l'agence sous la loi d'évaluation d'impact du Canada. Mais c'est cette agence-là qui est responsable de faire les consultations, de faire l'évaluation et qui est également responsable euh, de, 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 de l'attribution des permis. Ce n'est pas le, le ministère de, de l'environnement. Donc toute cette responsabilité-là, en vertu de la loi canadienne d'évaluation d'impact, est sous le ministère des ressources naturelles. Ça fait du sens, par contre, qu'il y ait un site de gestion des déchets nucléaires à un kilomètre de la rivière des Outaouais? Écoutez, euh, ce, ce, ce projet-là, comme vous le savez, c'est un projet qui est étudié depuis de très nombreuses années, bien avant le, la, la prise en cause devant la Commission canadienne de sûreté du nucléaire. Je pense qu'il il faut faire confiance aux gens qui ont, qui ont fait ces travaux-là pendant, pendant toutes ces années, ces consultations-là. Il y a plusieurs sites qui ont été, qui ont été explorés partout à travers le pays. I, as I told your fine colleague, uh, David, earlier, I said I should have been more specific, that I was talking to, to specifically about the, the project of the Troisième Lien, projects like that, that, uh, that, that project that is being proposed in, in Quebec. Vous avez une question? Oui, uh, sur Nordvolt, uh, le remblayage a commencé. Il y a beaucoup de, de, de gens au Québec. Uh, la, la population est divisée. Il y a des actions en cours. Uh, Votre perception à vous concernant ce méga projet-là, est-ce que c'est vous pouvez défendre en fait la position du gouvernement concernant évidemment du point de vue environnemental, mais globalement est-ce que c'est une bonne chose pour le Québec et qu'est-ce que vous pensez des gens qui s'y opposent à ce projet-là? Ben, je pense qu'en démocratie, c'est normal que différentes personnes aient différentes opinions. L'unanimité sur quelque projet que ce soit, euh, ça n'existe pas dans, 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 dans nos sociétés et, et c'est normal dans une société pluraliste. D'abord. Ensuite, il faut comprendre que on ne peut pas lutter contre les changements climatiques si on ne se débarrasse pas de notre dépendance aux combustibles fossiles. Ce n'est pas possible. Et dans le secteur des transports, notamment, ça passe par l'électrification. L'électrification n'est pas la seule solution. Ça passe notamment par les investissements massifs que notre gouvernement fait en transport collectif, des investissements de 30 milliards de dollars. Au cours des dernières années, il y a 400, plus de 400 km de métro et de trains légers qui ont été ajoutés grâce aux investissements fédéraux. 1700 km de, 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 de voies de transport actives comme, comme des pistes cyclables, par exemple. Euh, mais l'électrification est certainement l'une des solutions. Et quand on regarde sur le bilan de vie, par exemple, d'une un, voiture à essence versus une, une voiture électrique, au Québec, c'est 55 à 80 % moins d'impact sur l'ensemble. On ne parle pas juste de l'utilisation. Donc, l'électrification doit faire partie de la solution. Maintenant qu'il y a des gens qui s'opposent... 
Bien, écoutez, c'est pas, comme vous le savez, ce n'est pas le gouvernement fédéral qui décide euh, où sont faits les projets de transport collectif, où sont localisés les projets comme, comme l'usine de Nordvote ou celle de Volkswagen ou celle de, de Stellantis. Ce sont nos partenaires des municipalités et des provinces qui, qui, font ces, qui prennent ces décisions-là. Nous, on est là pour accompagner financièrement pour le développement de, de ces projets-là. Many Canadians have with this program. And what are those concerns? Well, people are seeing the higher prices on their bills. They're seeing even the cost of food is going up, and a lot of the producers are saying that it's because of the carbon tax that they have to pay. And you've said many times, no carve outs for farmers. So, what other fundamental changes are you I, making that's not just a name in my bank account? So, there's a couple of things um, I, uh, I feel I have to point out. Um, first, uh, the governor of the Bank of Canada has been very clear that carbon pricing is not contributing to inflation in this country. L l less than 1%, about 0.06%, number one. Number two, when we, put in, when we instituted carbon pricing, we already created a carve-out for about 95% of fuels used on farm. So what, what, what the Prime Minister and I said is that there would be no more new carve-outs, but we've already did that for, for, for farmers. And as you probably saw, Sylvain Charlebois from, uh, from Dalhousie University, who's probably known to be one of Canada's foremost experts on, on food policies, uh, has said that there is no evidence to support the claim by, well, he didn't say conservative uh, members, I will say it, that there is, there, that there is a link between, between carbon pricing and, and, and increased food prices. There's no data absolutely to point to, to, point to that fact. I haven't taken question from that side. You keep criticizing the Conservatives for their catchy slogans and such, including their advertising that blames the carbon pricing, as my colleague here said, and Canadians seem to, re it seems to resonate with Canadians. Why is it that your government isn't advertising carbon, the carbon pricing rebate and pushing it in the same way that they are? Listen, I mean, if, if Pierre Polyev was, was sincere in his effort to support Canadian uh, uh, with issues like affordability and, uh, and the energy sector, he would work with us and others to ensure that we tackle the obscene profits of well companies who are tr challenging just about everything we're doing to try and ensure that our kids and grandkids have a safe and clean future. But, but he's not. If, if Pierre Polyev was serious about supporting farmers, he would work with us to support. He's, he's claiming, and it's a claim, as usual, no basis to, to prove it, but that, that carbon pricing will cost farmers $1 billion by 2030. We've provided $1.5 billion of support to farmers in the last two years. For, for, for the transition towards a cleaner economy. So if he was serious about helping farmers or helping Canadians, he would work with us. But he's not, because what he's really trying to do is protect his friends in big oil companies who are making record level profits and who have contributed to climate change more than any other economic sector in our, in our country. But <laughs> It seems like the strategy isn't working, to Mark's point. It seems like this is not working. So are you going to change your strategy and how you approach these issues? I think, I think we can always do better. And, and when it comes to communicating about a complex issue like, like, like carbon pricing and, and the rebate, we, we want to make sure that we, we, we're on our front foot and, and we are doing as best as possible. This is today what we're presenting is, is one in, in many steps of, of ways we want to try and improve the, the communication. pushing it heavily like the Conservatives are pushing their message. Uh, well, I mean, in terms of uh, in terms of advertisement, some of you may have seen uh, even during the Super Bowl, we had a uh, publicity uh, talking about climate change and some of the things that the, the federal government is doing to, to to tackle the issue of climate change. It wasn't carbon pricing specific, but I think what you will see more and more of those initiatives in the, in the, in the coming months. Well, the, Biden administration, our largest, the Biden administration, our largest trading partner doesn't have a carbon tax and is pursuing their climate goals. Why are you so convinced that Canada needs one when some of our biggest allies don't have one? Do you know, I, I have, I've had the pleasure to go to Washington, D.C. A, a number of occasions since I've been um, nominated environment minister, and I've had U.S. senators tell me how much they envy the fact that we can do carbon pricing in Canada. Now, I don't know how many times in your life you've spoken to a U.S. senator, but it's been my experience that they don't tend to... to 
uh, to envy Canadians on many things, or at least not talk about it very publicly. But on carbon pricing, they would like to, many U U.S. legislators would like to be able to do carbon pricing because it's the cheapest way of reducing emissions, or certainly one of the cheapest ways. And yes, the Biden administration is pursuing an aggressive policy to, to fight climate change, but it's a very expensive one because they can't do carbon pricing. Merci so beaucoup. Thank Pierre, you very much. Be calling climate change bogus at a committee meeting earlier this week. Gobsmacked. Gobsmacked. I, it, it's really something to have somebody sit there as a credible witness and basically say that 99% of the scientists in the world are wrong. You said earlier today that the home heating oil exemption came because people in Atlantic Canada in particular yeah. said they needed more time yeah. to afford the technology. That's what grain farmers are saying about the need to have an exemption, at least temporarily, for grain drying until they can afford to pay for the technology. Why are you willing to do it for Atlantic Canadians and not for farmers? Well, that's not true, because I think 97% of those carve-outs for farmers were already done. That's quite a sizable amount, 97%. Um, what we were talking about here with home heating oil uh, were in provinces where you saw that dominate in Nova Scotia, Newfoundland and Labrador, people individually in their households did not have $22,000 to pony up in order to you know, fully avail of the savings that they should save uh, from, a, from a heat pump. So now we're, so that's a national policy that absolutely affects those provinces the most. Let me just say something else, I mean, because I think it's very easy to say, oh, rebrand, you know, that's gonna save the world. It isn't, but like you listen to people, the climate action incentive is eight years old, right, as a name. And look, if we, can, if we can speak the language that people speak, because people say the words carbon, they say the words rebate, right? And if we can speak that language, that's important so people understand what's going on here. Look, I'd be the first to say some of this, and I've said it before, is kind of counterintuitive. But the bottom line is that the Canada carbon ref uh, rebate, Canada carbon rebate is revenue neutral. It does help eight out of 10 families more. They get more, right? And whenever we're, we're talking about ax the tax, very catchy slogan. Um, certainly taken off in the House of Commons during question period. But can we have a serious conversation about how this is going to face, how this is going to affect people's budgets every month at home? Because that $1,200 a month for a family of four in Newfoundland and Labrador, or $600 for a single senior, they are budgeting that money. That is money they are budgeting in their household budget per month. So can we have a conversation about that? Your government is going after Pierre Polly a lot in your opening statements and in some of the questions, but it's not just the conservative leader who has issues with the carbon tax. Even uh, Manitoba Premier Wapknu is saying that he would like to look at maybe how it could play out differently in his province. Is there more here that needs to be done than just going after the Tories, but looking at how this can help other premiers as well? I think Premier Canoe knows this, but every province can do whatever they want as long as they meet their climate goals, as long as we meet our carbon goals. They can do... This, is, this program has complete and utter flexibility. The federal backstop comes in either at the invitation of the province or because, you know, they're not able to do what they're doing to meet the targets that we need them to meet. But other than that, they are able to do what they want, and that is a good thing. I mean, you know, this, is, this gets back to the talks that we've had about uh, home heating oil. This, this country was built on, you know, specificity here, a, an exemption here, a top up here, like, because the country's big and it's different. And where we can find solutions that match the problem on the ground, the better. I grew up in Goose Bay, Labrador. I used to think St. John's, Newfoundland was the long arm of the law. It's a big country. Things are different in different parts within a province, too. So this just allows us to be more specific. And what I think is a very, very good program that puts more money in people's pockets at the end of the day. Sorry, Mr. Can you uh, t tell us uh, what conversations you had with Ambassador Cohen today at your roundtable? Oh, it was terrific. So first of all, like you have to commend an American ambassador who was very interested in labor and bringing labor leaders together. I was really there just to bear witness. Um, but you had you know, a lot of big players from Unifor to the Teamsters. Everybody was gathered around. 
this is an administration that is so interested in what labor has to say. This is a president that has, you know, stood at auto workers' strike at a picket line and joined them. This is a, a president who's talked about unionization at Amazon. I mean, it, it's it's really something. And I've, you know, I've seen two administrations and worked with two administrations. This is a sea change. So he wanted because the president wants to know what are there, what, what what do we have in common? What problems do we have in common? What solutions do we have in common? And where can we work more closely in a bilateral way? It was it was very stimulating. Like the, what is the success metric here after this rebrand, as you say? I mean, like you're hoping that maybe your numbers in the polls go up. Is that what the goal is here? More money in people's pockets would be a big win for me and a lot of people at home. Less carbon in the air would be a big win for me, for people at home, and for the planet. That's a pretty good start. Out of today. I mean, we're we're just getting there. Different. We are getting there. And look, the more that we can communicate what this is really all about, the more that we can communicate that, look, what we are talking about here is a rebate, a rebate that you get. We want people to be able to identify it in their bank statements. We, we know that they're feeling it in their pocketbook. And we need people to understand that when we talk about Axe the Tax, we are talking about Axe the Rebate. And people are relying on that rebate. That rebate is $1,200 for a family of four in Newfoundland and Labrador, $600 for a single senior. For most, most people that I know, that is going to stuff that they need. It's important that they know that. So is this going to turn the tide on liberal support, do you think? Oh, wait and see. Thanks.